say that space is the final frontier. But many great mysteries are still waiting to be solved, right here on planet Earth. One such mystery, perhaps the best kept archaeological secret of the century, is found on the remote central Pacific island of Pompeii, in the heart of exotic Micronesia. Never before shown on television, the megalithic canal city of Nan Madol was built by a forgotten culture using a technology that has modern scientists completely bewildered. Native legends say this once flourishing Venice of the Pacific was actually built by magic. Join us as we voyage to the far reaches of our planet, challenging the facts of ancient history to reveal fascinating new evidence of our mysterious past. Based on the controversial Lost City books by Maverick archaeologist David Hatcher Childress, this is Lost City Adventures. Come with us now to the faraway Pacific island of Pompeii, deep in the tropical jungles of Micronesia, to solve the riddle of the Flying Stones of Nan Madal. The possibility that advanced ancient Pacific Islanders built monumental canal cities out of huge prismatic basalt crystals intrigued our Lost City crew, especially the legends about how they supposedly accomplished this dramatic engineering feat by levitating and flying in the stones. Could there be any truth to native legends? There is no known way um, consistent with the laws of physics to tap into the Earth's gravitational field. Is, uh, we have a large body of evidence that all types of mass um, feel the same acceleration and that all masses are attractive to each other. And there's uh, no known way to modify that field just using gravitational effects alone. You need to have another source of force such as um, air pressure or water buoyancy effect or electromagnetic effects in order to provide force that would counteract a gravitational field according to what we know about the laws of physics. However, ancient texts claim that highly trained Tibetan monks developed such a force by directing the harmonic resonances of concentrated group chanting. By tapping into the Earth's magnetic power grid, an invisible current forming a global energy body, the monks use this natural force to levitate the stones and thus built their exquisite monasteries in the forbidding terrain of the Himalayas. Sacred places and ancient ruins are found on this global energy network at places known as power spots. In the Pacific Ocean, there are Maui, Easter Island, and Pompeii. One thing to say about whether or not uh, sound waves could cause a levitation of an object, well, um, there is a possibility of that because sound waves cause pressure variations in air. And pressure variations in air do cause forces which can lift objects. A good example of how pressure variations in air can lift objects are the hovercraft that travel the English Channel. Whether or not um, by a very careful focusing of sound waves produced by people one could cause small objects to levitate um, is an interesting question. If it were going to be done by air pressure, it's something that would be conceivable if one could produce the amount of pressure needed to raise the object. 
Indeed, scientists are successfully levitating objects using ceramic superconductors cooled by liquid nitrogen. Dr. Walter Hardy, UBC's resident guru in low temperature physics, explains. When you have the magnet there, when it's warm and you cool it down, it actually expels the magnetic uh, flux from the magnet and levitates it. But what about levitating something bigger, like huge stones perhaps? Eventually there'll be maglev trains. Certainly the Japanese are working very hard on it and they have demonstration uh, tracks. Enough science for now. Let's get to the tropics. Air travelers from North America to Micronesia must stop over in Hawaii. Tough break. Try to suffer through. The Bishop Museum is the world center for Polynesian studies, where senior anthropologist Dr. Yoshihiko Sinoto, the recognized authority on Polynesian culture, remembers the first time he saw the ruins at Nan Modal some 30 years ago. Many sites are covered by uh, mangrove trees, and suddenly you can see the huge stone structure. Actually, there are about nearly 90 man-made platforms on the shallow reef. On top of it, there were house site, uh, royal family's house site, ceremonial platforms, burial platforms, and uh, kind of a walled structure. And those structures all made by prism basalt rocks. You know, those naturally basalt broke into a hexagonal shape and uh, 15 feet long and uh, maybe 20, 24 inches diameter. And they have to carry, they had to carry those rocks from main island of Ponape to that reef area and start building just like a log house, just like a log house. And when you see that, the impression you get Oh my God, you know, a South Pacific island that can build such a big, you know, structures. How they could carry such a heavy basalt columns? But they did. Hawaii has some impressive stones too, right on the beach at Waikiki. These are wizard stones said to contain spirits of powerful kahunas who deliberately put themselves here. Native Hawaiians believe they move at night. We know what you're wondering now, same as this guy. Just where the hell is Micronesia anyway? We weren't sure either, so we asked some of the local heavies, and they tried to sell us a map. In fact, this guy insisted. So we bought it, and we still don't know. This didn't help. Getting to Micronesia is something of an adventure in itself. We're in the cargo hold of an Air Micronesia 727 jet. It's like the airline version of a tram steamer. Half of it's cargo, the other half is for passengers. It's a long range island hopper because we'll be stopping in many islands on our way across the Pacific. Our first stop, two hours out of Honolulu, is the last of the Hawaiian island chain, Johnston Island, a high security military base. From there, we'll go on to the capital of the Marshall Islands, the Atoll of Majuro. Our next stop is then the Atoll of Kwajalein, another American military base. From there, we'll go on to the first of the Carolyn Island chain, Kosrai. And there, we'll begin our quest for the lost cities of the South Pacific. Micronesia is actually thousands of islands and atolls in four major island chains spread over seven million square miles in the Central Pacific. The Air Mike Island hopper leaves Hawaii at 6 a.m. for the flight west crosses the international dateline twice, and lands at one U.S. military island with its very own time zone. As one traveler put it, you'll fly from today to tomorrow, back to yesterday, and land again in tomorrow. Makes you tired just thinking about it. 
All this time zone jumping only gets you as far as Koshrai, where Dr. Sinoto suggested we check out the ancient stone port city of Leila. But our first stop is the top secret US military destruct facility of Johnston Island, two hours by air from Honolulu. You can't get off the plane at Johnston Island without military clearance, but it's unlikely you would want to in any case. Johnston is where all good nuclear bombs are sent to be diffused. This is also where dangerous chemicals such as Agent Orange and nerve gas are stored in concrete bunkers like these bordering the runway. Johnston Island, truly the mecca of hazardous waste. Johnston Island was also the scene of the infamous 1962 Starfish atmospheric nuclear bomb test that went horribly wrong and permanently altered the Earth's Van Allen radiation belt. This convinced Glenn Seaborg, then chairman of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, that any nuclear exchange would damage the Earth's upper atmosphere forever. Johnston Island, definitely not a tourist destination. But Majuro Atoll is. Diving, dancing, and drinking are the main tourist activities on wild Majuro, capital of the Marshall Islands. Treasure Island author Robert Louis Stevenson called Majuro the Pearl of the Pacific and wrote his novel In the South Seas here in 1889. It's also a refueling stop on our journey west. Site of a US Navy base during World War II, the only road on Majuro stretches from Laura to Rita, Beach towns named after actresses Lauren Bacall and Rita Hayworth by the Marines stationed here. Good thing Whoopi Goldberg wasn't around then. You wouldn't have to ask any of the courageous soldiers who fought here during World War II in some of the fiercest, bloodiest fighting in history. Where the hell is Micronesia? Although it's probably a question they asked in 1944 when ordered to storm the beaches at Kwajalein, the second major Pacific battleground where US soldiers spilled their blood on the reef after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Once they took Kwajalein, they never gave it up. And today, the world's largest atoll is a transplanted American suburb with all the conveniences provided free to the Americans stationed here. But not to Marshallese workers who are required by US military law to return each night to the adjacent island of Ebai, where conditions more resemble an overcrowded American inner city. Uncle Sam's tax dollars at work. Kwajalein is still a U.S. Army base today, more precisely, a U.S. Army missile firing range, which makes Kwajalein's huge lagoon a big bullseye in the middle of the ocean for the ICBM's launch from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. This is why Kwajalein has its own time zone, same as the U.S. West Coast, so missiles fired from California on Wednesday won't land on Frankie fishing in the lagoon on Thursday because some idiot got the day wrong wasn't the Cold War fun. This concludes the military portion of our trip. After flying for days, and just kidding, we reach Koch Rai, the easternmost island of the Caroline chain, where we will explore the mysterious ruins of the lost city of Leila.
our long day's journey into flight finally is an end. Exploration of the lost city of Layla will begin in earnest in the morning. But first, we dance. Rich in natural beauty, Koh Shrai is one of the largest but least developed major islands in Micronesia. There aren't many hotel rooms, but the rooms here at Sandy Beach look like the proverbial grass shacks on those postcards from paradise you get from Uncle Louie and Aunt Edna on their annual world cruise. No one seems to be in any hurry to see Koh Shrai change. Especially a certain adventure author who prides himself in putting the role back into the rock of archaeology. Here he is now, languidly leaping into action after last night's beach party. Early morning air temperature on Koh Shrai, 85 degrees. Humidity, 1,000%. The deep tropics. It can be pouring rain in sheets one moment, and the sun can be blazing the next. There's something missing here. There's no golf course. There's no dinner show. There's no poolside service. There's no pool. But on the other hand, there are no crowds. There are no people hustling you. There are no high prices. And that's how I love to travel. It's a way of traveling I like to call ecotourism. Instead of going to a place and having all the frills and programmed entertainment, it's going someplace and being part of it, getting into the people and the history and the culture, and leaving the environment just as I found it. The ancients were no fools. They lived in harmony with the environment. One of the benefits of traveling the world in search of lost cities is that the ancients often built in the most beautiful places. That's one of the reasons they built here on Koh Sri. They also may have built here because Koh Sri, along with the island of Pompeii, is at the convergence of many ley lines, marking this as one of the so-called power spots of the world. Remember the world power grid and the chanting monks? I love riding in the back of these pickups. That's how you get around in Coast Ride. Yep, wind in your back, the ocean right in front of you. We're heading for the lost city of Layla. Layla is a separate island joined to the main island by this causeway. Off to the left is a deep natural pool in the lagoon where they buried the kings who once ruled over the ancient city. We'll scuba dive there after investigating the ruins. Riding into Layla past a few homes and businesses, there isn't a stone wall or canal in sight, but you get a good glimpse of how most people live in this sleepy waterfront village. Seems like a good life. But Layla is deceptive. The actual ruins lie behind these homes, and to get to them, we must negotiate our way through a pig farmer's backyard, which, if you've ever been around pigs, is an overwhelming aromatic adventure in itself. Put David off bacon for weeks. We're not too far out of range of the pigs when we begin to see evidence of the ruins of the hidden city of Layla. Suddenly, the outside world felt miles away as basalt walls rose next to this old trail paved with coral rubble. Soon, bigger walls and collapsed structures covered with thick tropical vegetation appeared, and we began to appreciate Dr. Sinoto's sense of awe at what early South Pacific islanders constructed from volcanic stone. These vast, encompassing ruins are a totally unexpected sight out here in the tropics. This canal is part of a much larger, primarily man-made system that not only encircles the ruins of Layla, but is connected to a much larger canal system on Koh Rai. As we explored Layla's ruins, we crossed more canals, saw burial mounds, numerous walls of huge hexagonal basalt logs, in this remaining section of a coral plaza, where one imagines early Koshrayans singing, dancing, trading goods, and offering tributes to their kings. But our brief wanderings leave us unprepared for our first sight of the megalithic walls of the main compound called Kenya Fulat.
Layla's construction dates back at least to 1250 AD, but some scholars have people living here as early as 50 AD. Early Kashrayans extended the low part of Layla by piling stones on the surrounding reef. They used this new land to build a massive walled city for Koshrayan royalty. This royal city once covered the entire lowland area of Layla Island. Though much of the outskirts have been destroyed, the remaining ruins still cover a third of the island. We still don't know who built Layla or how. Only the legends remain. One legend here on Khosrai claims that two magicians came from Tahiti. They came here to build this city. According to the legend, they went to a mountain in the interior of the island called Mount Finko. It's about 10 miles from here. What they did then, according to the legend, was magically levitate these stones and move them into place where we see them now. Levitated the stones. Easter Island, Nan Madal, Layla. It's a recurring theme in Islander legends about megalithic structures. Could it be true? David couldn't get the thought out of his mind that the ancients knew something we've lost or never knew. And as darkness descended upon the mysterious city, suddenly he felt alone, isolated in the dense overgrowth of a forgotten culture's ruins. He wondered what amazing sight the jungle held for him next. After his close encounter of the jungle kind, David decides to do something less dangerous, like go diving in the burial pool of the Koshrayan kings. Right, nothing like swimming in an underwater cemetery to soothe the nerves. Perhaps fearing some evil curse or out of respect for the dead, the locals won't dive here. But we found no bones, just lots of coral and clownfish. Temperature outside, 85 degrees. In the water, 85 degrees. Sort of like swimming in very thick air. One of the difficulties in reconstructing the ancient history of Khosrai is the lack of any oral histories or continuous archaeological record. The reason for this is that most of the population was wiped out in a civil war just prior to European contact and then further decimated by diseases brought in by whalers in the early 1800s. The real history of Khosrai then begins in the mid-1800s with the arrival of Congregationalist missionaries from Boston. They saved the population from almost certain extinction. However, the ancient traditions of Khosrai almost all but vanished. As a result, the people here now know very little of their own history. David rents a boat for a trip on the Khosrai canal system. Connell drives the boat, Father Donald owns the boat, the dive shop, and the hotel. That's Donald next to other son, Ronald. Connell, Donald, and Ronald, the power trio of Khosrai. First rule of boating, never leave the pilot stranded out on the mangrove spikes. <laughs> Connell does some fine stepping here on a submerged log to regain his ship. Nice footwork, Connell. Koshrai was once home to a culture whose people engineered a complex canal system and moved thousands of huge stones to construct a great walled city for their royalty. 
But their history is lost, their knowledge and secrets vanished forever. What happened on this mysterious island? Perhaps the answer can be found on an island where the history of a megalithic canal city lives on. Next stop, Pompeii, and the city known as the Venice of the Pacific, Nan Madal. volcanic island of Pompeii is a paradise of physical superlatives. Rugged tropical rainforests, 2,000 foot mountains, plunging waterfalls, a beautiful lagoon, twisting canals and steep cliffs, the most famous being Soques Rock, the diamond head of Micronesia. With an annual rainfall of over 400 inches in the interior, Pompeii is one of the wettest, greenest, and most beautiful places anywhere on earth. Waiting to pick David up at the airport is the owner of the Hotel Pompeii, Mercedes Santos, matriarch of the Santos family, one of the biggest clans on the island. She knows everybody, everybody knows her, and she can get it for you wholesale. David wastes no time getting to the most important topics. Where are all your daughters? At home. At home? <laughs> now we know why David always likes to come back to his favorite place here on the island, Hotel Pompeii. On Pompeii, Casalalia, like aloha means hello or goodbye and sums up the languid life of the tropics. Nobody cares if you're coming or going. The people are friendly, making Pompeii truly a paradise found. For a really close-up view of Sokes Rock, take a boat trip round Sokes Harbor. During World War II, Japanese occupiers made Pompeians carry heavy naval cannons and mounts a thousand feet up these cliffs. It took almost a year to put them up there, but Pompeians claim they were able to do it by using a special magic makes things lighter. Feasting is very important on Pompeii, and David is the guest of honor at the first birthday party of Demo Santos, Mercedes' youngest relative. The first birthday of the male child calls for a traditional feast, but on Pompeii, any excuse for a feast is a good one. One thing was guaranteed, nobody was going home hungry. The kids are very excited, but have to wait their turn, as the order for entering a traditional feasting house is very strict. Nan Marquis, or High Chiefs, must enter first, then guests of honor, then nobility, then everybody else. Remembering the trek to Layla, David declined the roast pig. David got a little skunked at the party keeping up with the toddlers. Man, what was in that punch? It put David right into his favorite fantasy. Elvis, the missing archaeologist. Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis Hatcher Childress.
Elvis has left the cabana. We leave bright and early for the four-hour drive to Nanmadal, passing first through the Kapinga Marangi village, home of Polynesian refugees regarded as some of the best carvers in the Pacific region. The road is good through town and out beyond the causeway, but the road and terrain quickly change just a few miles outside of Colonia. In fact, this road is so scarred by potholes from the continuous ravages of the Pompeii rains, the work on it goes on year round to keep it from turning into a muddy ditch. The roads outside of Colonia are so bad, they are known as being among the worst in Micronesia. Out here, a man's wealth is determined by the number of pigs he owns. Somebody's life savings is escaping. Quick, call the bank guard. Part of the legend of Namadal and of this island is that before they built the gigantic city of Namadal, they actually started to build at three other places first. One's at Sokes Rock, uh, another place over there near Kitty, all along the coast. But it wasn't until their third location, the location here at Temwen Island, where we're going right now, that they found the, the spot. And they found it when they stood atop this pyramid-shaped mountain overlooking the lagoon. From here, it is said, the two brothers who built Nanmadal saw the underwater ruins of another city called Kanamweso and decided to build Nanmadal on top of it. This is the Pompeii Agricultural Trade School, or PATS. Run by Jesuits, it's the oldest school on the island. We're now leaving the main island of Pompeii and crossing to the island of Temwen, where we'll find the ruins of Nanmadal. Pompeii is a typical volcanic island rising from the ocean floor to peaks 2,000 feet above the surrounding lagoon, protected from the sea by the encircling barrier reef. And for those of you who've been dying to know what an atoll is, it's what's left of the reef when a volcanic island blows its top. Pompeii is the third largest island in Micronesia, but has the most uninhabited landmass due to the extremely rainy conditions of the interior. Here's where we started today, two lifetimes ago and 50 miles away by bouncing truck. So $10 for Normally accessible on foot, okay, unseasonably high tides right. forced David to negotiate right, for go. an outrigger to get us to Nan Madal. We're just now coming up to Nan Madal, the canal city. Nandao is the main structure. It's coming up right up ahead. After paddling for 30 minutes in the driving rain, David enters the main canal, and the ancient city rises up before him. respect for the ancient traditions of the Saudala kings who once ruled here, David asked permission to enter their holy sanctuary of Nandas. I humbly ask of the Saudala kings permission to enter the sanctuary of Nandas. No lightning bolts strike him, so David enters. The scale of Nandawas is absolutely astounding. Five, 10, 20 ton prismatic basalt crystals stacked log cabin style in walls 15 feet thick, 30 feet high, and longer than a city block. This cornerstone alone weighs over 50 tons. The structure grew more impressive at each turn, more than we could possibly have ever imagined, especially considering that the nearest sources for this type of columnar basalt are volcanic plugs found on the far side of the island. 
How could primitive islanders have quarried and moved such heavy basalt columns, and once here lifted them 30 feet into place? We finally truly understood the awe with which Dr. Sinoto spoke of his first visit to Nanmadal. It is natural for basalt to take on magnetic properties as it cools, but these stones at the entrance to Nandawas are strangely magnetized. Could this be associated with the magic that levitated the stones to build Nanmadal? Uninhabited when the first Europeans came here in 1528, no one can say for certain how old the ruins are, though estimates range wildly from 1,000 to 4,000 years but it would have taken thousands of islanders decades to build this compound alone. And it is only one of 92 other similar structures built out on this reef. This is part of an extensive tunnel network that goes all beneath Nan Madal. Why and how it was built, we don't know, but these tunnels go throughout the city, even out into the reef. Some archaeologists believe that this underground structure was one of the tombs of the Sadalair kings, while other archaeologists maintain that this was a jail, and still others say that this was part of the tunnel system of Namadal. In 1870, this structure was 12 meters deeper than it is today. Since then, it was apparently filled in with basalt columns and coral rubble. It was getting dark when the bats came out, reminding us the Pompeians warn against disturbing the spirits by staying overnight on Nanmadal. So we left the ancient city, knowing we would return the next day. Jean Ashby, author and English professor at the Community College of Micronesia, has been living on Pompeii since 1971 after fleeing Uganda during Idi Amin's reign of terror. Though it's his paradise now, he once planned on leaving. When I had my yacht, I was trying to fix it up and these other yachts would come in and I said, I gotta fix this up and sail out of here. And they said, sail out of here, you're at the place that people sail to. <laughs> Are people afraid to go to the ruins there at Namadal? Some superstitions there or something? Yeah, they are. They're afraid, but they're not. Um, I don't like to go to a cemetery at night. I feel kind of spooky. And uh, they don't like to go to Namadal for the same reason. It, Namadal essentially is, is a cemetery. Uh, there's tombs there. They've been excavated and things of this sort. And they know their ancestors are buried there, and they, they don't feel comfortable about it at all. I've seen college-educated um, Ponapeans, and I've asked them, uh, do you really believe that those stones flew across the mountains and uh, to Nan Madal? And the answer always is, well, that's what we've been told. I mean, it's, it's fine, that's what we've been told. And, and one of them got on me on the Immaculate Conception and says, do you believe that? And so I guess I believe things on faith, they believe things on faith. The interesting thing is Sakao stones are all over the place. And so they're still drinking a lot of Sakao as they did a thousand years ago. Have you had Sakao? Sakao is used in all important ceremonies on Pompeii and is made by pounding Indian pepper root on a flat stone and then squeezing it through hibiscus fibers. This produces a mildly narcotic drink with the consistency of loose pudding. Drinking Sakao is a weird experience. Your head stays completely coherent, but you can hardly stand up. David would try some Sakao tonight, but first he needed to go for a hike, get some air, and think about Nan Madal. I'm standing on the top of Pusang Malik, also known as Chicken Shit Mountain, a volcanic plug of prismatic basalt crystals on the far side of the island from Nan Madal. This could have been the source of the crystals used to build the city. If it had been, you can well imagine that this volcanic plug was at least 10 times the size that it is now. David wondered what it would be like to literally fly the stones from here, so he hitched a ride in a British stall aircraft. 
What had been a tortuous four-hour drive by land was a mere 15-minute flight to the ruins of Nan Madol. From the air, we could clearly see the scope of this incredible city. Spread over 11 square miles, the rectangular shapes of individual islands and the precise geometry of the canal system are plainly visible. Each island at Nan Madol had special feasting or administration functions serving the high chiefs. For example, Darong was a walled-in lake for ceremonial clam fishing. The massive sea walls were also burial mounds, and this is Nandawas, the main tomb of the Saudala kings. Classical surrealist, artist Lauren Adams, shares his vision of the legend of Nan Madol in its heyday. But what method did they use to build this place? How did the stones get here? That uh, still is a mystery, but you have to understand that we we used a lot of spirits in the past, I mean magic. We have magic to make things lighter. Uh, magic spells, I mean. Magic spells to make things lighter. Right, so you can carry things uh, that are very heavy. Even they're, they're still used today. But uh, some people say that those rocks were flown in. Possible. Flown, flown. Uh, by magic, they were just called for and they came flying. Ready, I've also heard other stories about another city there, a sunken city? A sunken city, Kanemweso. Kanemweso. Mm. Well, I hope you won't look for it. Because that city is meant for spirits and not for human flesh. Is there some. Uh, Legend concerning uh, Kanemweso and Nan Madol. Uh, it's two different cities, right? Mm -hmm. They said when they were looking for a suitable place, they looked over and, and saw this sunken city. So they went to the place to build one. But the city they saw, I guess, was shown to them by spirits. So you won't, I doubt if you will find and find it under the water. <laughs> So we go from a sakao bar in the ancient spirits of Namadol, here for some distilled spirits at the Little Micronesia Bar. It could be any end of the world bar in some Graham Green novel. I like to come here and have a beer and relax, shoot a game of pool with Ricky. He owns this joint. It's your shot. Go easy on me, all right? Hey, I told you to go easy on me. <laughs> but I did. Edgar Santos knows Pompeii on land and under the water. He's the top scuba guide here, and despite Bretty's warning, has offered to take us diving to look for the legendary city of Canem Weso. He has a unique perspective on the construction of Nan Madol. It was built by uh, brute strength and magic. There's no other explanation. Uh, inclined planes, rafts, don't fit. Uh, you put these 50-ton rocks on a raft, it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. We had heard early diving expeditions found columns that might be ruins from an underwater city, and we wanted to check it out ourselves. Here's the first of six columns we found, all within 100 yards, laid out in a line roughly paralleling the seawall above. Some claim these columns are a natural occurrence, while others say they're stones that fell from rafts transporting them to Nan Madol. But if either claim were true, why are these columns standing vertically in a row? We had explored Nan Modal on land, from the air and underwater. Now it was time to look at it from the sea, so we headed for the canal system in Edgar's boat. 
After racing past the gigantic monoliths of the outer seawall, we entered the canals and floated past Pan Kadira. This was the administrative center of Nanmadal and was also known as the Forbidden City. This is Eded, the religious center where an annual two-week ritual culminated with offerings of cooked turtle innards to Nan Sanwal, the holy eel kept in the compound pool. This is the entrance to the islet called Pai Kok, which had two pools for raising and harvesting turtles. This long, low structure is what's left of the main communication center, Paikop Sowawas, where scores of drummers conducted ritual drumming, sent messages, and sounded alarms. As we floated around the corner past Nandalas for the last time, we thought of the many mysterious sights we'd seen and the many friends we'd made in Micronesia. And we were sure of one thing, We'll be back soon for another Lost City adventure. We hope you enjoyed coming along on the journey.